what we're going to do today is uh, operate in the same mode as in the last class. We will play back some recorded lectures and then we will have discussions. But from the next class onwards, you should be viewing these lectures on your own before coming to the class and we will only have discussions in the class. Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we are going to look at some more details of 2's complement representation of signed integers. Here is a quick recap of some topics related to this lecture that we have seen earlier. We have seen how integers are represented in a computer and we have seen this for both unsigned integers and signed integers. In this lecture, we are going to look at a bit more closely uh, at two's complement representation for signed integers. We have already seen this earlier uh, slightly sketchily. We are going to look at it a bit more closely today. And we are also going to see how the magnitude of negative integers represented in two's complement representation can be computed. So now for signed integers, we have already seen that we could treat the most significant bit as the sign bit. And if the most significant bit is 1, then we could treat the integer as a negative integer. And if the MSB is 0, we could treat it as a positive integer. This representation is also called the sign magnitude representation for obvious reasons. And we have seen uh, similar examples earlier where here I am trying to represent integers using 3 bits and I have arranged the integers along a circle. Uh, as an unsigned integer, this represents 0, this represents 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So I have represented the binary representations of these unsigned integers along this circle in this order 0 to 7. And now I want to interpret these sequences of zeros and 1s as 2's complement representation of integers. So here are the MSB0 representations, here are the MSB1 representations and in the sign magnitude the MSB just gives you the sign, the rest of it gives you the magnitude. So we have seen that this corresponds to plus 0, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3 and then minus 0, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. We have also seen uh, that this basically corresponds to 2 increasing directions, one in this way and the other in this way. These are 2 different increasing directions and it also gives rise to this wasteful representation where we have 2 representations of 0. Now before we go to 2's complement representation, we would like to ask that well how else could we represent negative integers uh, in binary. So using the MSP to represent the sign is really convenient because we could just look at one bit and tell whether the number is positive or negative. And so here is our circle again and if we say that our MSP still represents the sign, so we know that these are plus 0, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3. Now what about these? Here the MSP is 1 and so these must represent negative integers. But what negative integer should we let each of these sequences of zeros and 1s represent? So for example, what negative number should 100 0, 0 represent? What should 111 1, 1 represent? And so on. In trying to answer this question, what we might want to think of this circle as a wrapped around number line. So if you think of this circle as a wrapped around number line, then I can see that from here to here, the numbers are increasing plus 0, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3. These are going to be negative integers. So can I somehow think of this circle, can I somehow unwrap this circle into a number line such that along the number line I get 0, 1, 2, 3 at these positions and these correspond to negative integers and still I can think of the unwrapped circle as a usual number line. So in order to break up a circle into a number line, we have to figure out where to break this circle. Now there are two logical points to break where the MSP is changing. So this is one point where I am going from 1 to 0 and this is the other point where I am going from 0 to 1. Now if I broke the circle at this point, then I would get a number line which starts like this 0, 1, 2, 3 and then there are 4 numbers which if I assume the MSP to be representing the sign should be negative numbers. So my number line would now look like this, right? So I have broken the circle here. So I get 0, 1, 2, 3 and then I get these numbers with the blue MSP. And if I want to treat this as a number line and say that well the numbers are increasing this way, 
what you will see is that here I must have something which is greater than plus 3 and so really there is no space for negative integers. So if I want to take this circle and unwrap it as a number line this is not a good place to break if we want these 4 binary sequences to represent negative integers. So what is the other logical point? The other logical point is here. So let us see what happens if you break the circle there. So now we are going to break the circle there and that gives rise to this number line where we start off with the binary sequences with the blue MSP, MSP of 1 and then we get the binary sequences with the red MSP, MSP of 0 and these we already know are plus 0, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3 because we want to treat the MSP as the sign bit and when the number is positive we just want to treat the number as it is an unsigned integer. So now the question is that given this number line clearly we can find out the direction in which the numbers are increasing that is the increasing direction. So now what negative numbers, what negative integers should I place here so that I get an increasing number line, I get consecutive integers and I am also able to represent negative integers. Clearly the choice is obvious this will be minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4 and you can see that this is now consistent with the increasing direction. I have represented consecutive integers and all of them are increasing in this direction. So this is what motivates the 2's complement representation. We are going to try to represent negative integers such that this corresponds to minus 4, this corresponds to minus 3, this corresponds to minus 2, this corresponds to minus 1 because this allows us to break this circle at this convenient point and then treat this unwrapped circle as an increasing number line. So this is the picture that uh, we have seen earlier along the circle I am going to put minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1. So this gives me one completely increasing sweep as I go around the circle in this direction and of course at the end when I come back from plus 3 to minus 4 there is a wrap around in terms of our previous picture the number line picture this is really going back from this end to this end right 0, 1, 1 to 1, 0, 0 plus 3 to minus 4. And uh, it is easy to see that we can now represent 8 numbers uh, using 8 combinations of 3 bits. So there is no wastage and we have only one representation of 0. Now an interesting question that comes here is that when the numbers were positive we could just read off the numbers as if they were unsigned integers and put plus sign before to get the signed integer. Now when the numbers are negative we have this strange thing that 1, 0, 1 which as an unsigned integer would represent 5 and if you just look at the magnitude uh, which is the bits in black it would represent 1 but we want this to represent the signed integer minus 3. Similarly if you look at this number 1, 1, 1 as an unsigned integer it would represent 7. If you just look at the magnitude which are the bits in black it would represent 3 but we want this to represent minus 1. So a question to ask is that can we have a mapping of the binary representation to the magnitudes of the negative integers. So I would like to go from this 1, 1 to 1, I would like to go from this 1, 0 to 2, from this 0, 1 to 3 and from 0, 0 to 4. So how do we come up with this mapping? So this is our desired mapping when we are using 3 bits, 1, 1 should map to 1. Remember I am just interested in the magnitude now because the MSB has already told me that it is a negative integer. So I want 1, 1 to map to the magnitude 1, 1, 0 to map to the magnitude 2, 0, 1 to map to the magnitude 3, 0, 0 to map to the magnitude 4 and while 1, 0 as an unsigned integer does represent 2 but 0, 1 as an unsigned integer does not represent 3, similarly 1, 1 as an unsigned integer does not represent 1. So we need to come up with a more sophisticated mapping than just reading off this binary sequence as an unsigned integer. Now the first observation we have is that if you look at this 1, 1 over here which is actually coming from here, right? these are the negative integers and here the magnitude is represented by 1, 1. 1, 1 as an unsigned integer represents 3, however we want it to represent 1. So this 1 what we want it to represent can be thought of as 4 minus 3. Similarly 1, 0 as an unsigned integer represents 2 and we want it to represent the magnitude 2. So it can be thought of as 4 minus 2. Similarly 0, 1 as an unsigned integer represents 1, we want it to represent 3 
so it can be thought of as 4 minus 1 which is 3 and similarly 0 0 as an unsigned integer it represents 0 we want it to represent 4 so it can be thought of as 4 minus 0 which is 4. So this basically tells us that really if we want to get the magnitude of the unsigned if we want to get the magnitude of the negative integer from this binary representation in 2's complement we can just look at the bits that claim to represent the magnitude we can find out what it represents as an unsigned integer and subtract that unsigned integer from an appropriate power of 2. What was the appropriate power of 2 here? It was 2 squared because this is the largest magnitude that you can represent using 3 bits in 2's complement. 4 is the largest magnitude that you can represent in 3 bits using 2's complement. So we want 4 minus 0 equal to 4 at this end and that is why we are subtracting from 2 squared which is 4. Yet another way to think about this is to say that you look at 1 1 which represents the unsigned integer 3, flip all the bits you get 0 and then you add 1 to it and that gives you the magnitude that you want it to represent. You look at 1 0 which represents the unsigned integer 2 but you want it to represent 2 so flip all the bits you get the unsigned integer 1 then add 1 to it you get 2 and so on. 0 1 which represents the unsigned integer 1 but you want it to represent 3. So flip all the bits you get the unsigned integer 2 add 1 and you get 3 and so on for 0 0 as well. 0 0 when you flip you get 1 1 which represents the unsigned integer 3 you add 1 then you get 4. So if you look at these two ways of computing the magnitude of the negative integers you see that one way of accomplishing this basically finding out the difference of the magnitude represented by the black sequence of bits from 2 squared or from that appropriate power of 2 if you have higher number of bits there is really to go like this. You can flip the bits find out the decimal equivalent and then add 1 to it. So this is what uh, we can do if we are asked a question that can you find out the magnitude of what this represents in 2's complement. So there are two ways. Uh, in both ways we will first look at the MSP figure out that it is a negative integer and then what we could do is we could look at the rest of the representation flip every bit find out what it represents in decimal add 1 and then the absolute value is 9 in this case and so the answer is minus 9. Alternatively we could also solve the same problem in the following way the MSB is 1 so it is a negative integer now to get the absolute value of this you ignore the MSB. So you get decimal 7 and then you say I am going to subtract 7 from 2 raised to 4 in which case I get 9. Now where did this 2 raised to 4 come from? This is the number of bits in the magnitude there are 4 bits in the magnitude which is the total number of bits minus 1 because the total number of bits also has one sign bit. So in this case also the answer is minus 9. So in summary we saw the rationale behind 2's complement representation and we saw two simple ways of arriving at the magnitude of negative integers from 2's complement representation. Thank you. So this is what we have seen unsigned and signed integers is what we had seen earlier. What Suprateek has done is since there were questions raised on proper understanding of 2's complement he thought he will add this that is the lecture that you just saw. So this is the quiz express minus 32 as an 8-bit signed integer in 2's complement represent. So just a hint, you are not talking about a 4-bit, 5-bit, 3-bit number, we are talking of an 8-bit number. That means the total representation will consist of 8 bits. Just before you attempt this quiz, let me do a recap. What is the largest number these 8 bits are able to represent if you represent only unsigned integers? 2 to the power 8? minus 1 because at best you can have all 1's. So from 0 to all 1's and all 1's is to the power 8 minus 1. What about signed representation? 8 bit. So 1 bit will go for sign. So you have only 7 bits for magnitude reprint. That most significant bit could be 0 or 1 saying it is either positive or negative and the largest magnitude that you can store in such a way you would have now only 7 bits to represent magnitude so you will have 2 raised to power 7 minus 1 
as the largest magnitude represented for a signed represent. But there, what is the problem? You have zero having two representations. And therefore, you lose one particular representation for a useless purpose, minus zero plus zero. And that is the reason why we have two scoping. So now, start, work out this answer. Suggest that don't just write the final answer. In your notebook, you actually work out using any methods that he has suggested. You have written down this question on your notebook. Then for your reference, I would like to keep the previous slide in front of you. This will give you a hint. So notice that here it is asking a question, how do you figure out 10111? So the first one is the sine bit. And therefore, that has to be 1 for minus 32. Now, figure out how minus 32 would be represented. I think you are getting more confused. So, let me just stick to this. Figure it out. Let it take 3, 4 minutes, no problem. And don't worry if it is wrong. It's only a practice quiz. And as usual, you will get an opportunity to discuss with your neighbors. All right. So, all of you have done that. Okay, how many of you have not yet got the answer? Please raise your hands. Some people. No problem. This will happen. So now, let us do the think pair share activity. Again, I request that people who have odd number of students on a desk, the three people on a side should combine and rotate their notebooks. So please rotate your notebooks. So all sharing has happened. All right, just raise hand if the answers were different from your own answer. One, two, no, no, raise hand loud and clear. All right, now where the answers were different, have you been able to convince each other what would be the correct answer? Or there is still confusion? Only a few people seem to have confusion. Rest all seem to agree. All right. So let me pick up randomly someone here. Okay. How many people disagree with this answer? Wow. We have a hundred percent vote. So this answer is correct. More importantly, each one has understood how this answer was discovered. So now, assume I am the Dumbo and you are explaining to me how this represents minus 32. So, can someone help me? Okay. So, he says, since I have to represent minus 32, the most significant bit has to be 1. So, this is explained well. Now, I have remaining 7 bits to figure out. For the last 7 bits, we have uh, 7. So, we raise 2 raised to our 7, it would be 128. Because we have to represent in 8, so the last would be 2 raised to power 7, 128 and as we have to calculate 32, so we would subtract uh, 32 from 128. It would give us 96 and we found, uh, find out the 7, did, uh, seven uh, bit representation for the 96 and place it after 7. So what is the 7 bit representation? And All agree that that is what I have to find out. How do you find the 7 bit representation of 96? By dividing by 2. Keep dividing by 2, two, two and taking keep the collecting remainder. the remainders and the last yeah. one till it becomes 0. That everybody is familiar with, right? So you all agree that this representation will turn out to be 11000000? Problem solved. All right. Now we will look at, look at the floating point representation. Please listen to this video carefully. Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we are going to see how floating point numbers are represented inside a computer. Here is a quick recap of the relevant topics. We have already seen the architecture of a simple computer and in a previous lecture, we also looked at how integers both signed and unsigned are represented in a computer. In this lecture, we are going to see how a computer internally represents floating point numbers and how in, C, in a C++ program you can declare float, floating point variables. 
Now this is a picture that we have seen earlier, this is the basic structure of our simple computer with different parts and at any snapshot of operation of this computer you will see sequences of zeros and ones everywhere. So what we want to ask is how do we represent numbers like 3.14 into 10 raised to minus 23 in a computer using sequences of zeros and ones. So these are called floating point numbers, numbers with fractional values, very small numbers or very large numbers that cannot be represented as integers. And what we are going to study today is you know when we write a number like this, how is it that we can represent it in a computer using a sequence of zeros and ones. So let us look at this floating point number minus 3.123 into 10 raised to minus 11. This is the quote unquote floating point in this number. Now this this number when we look at minus 3.123 into 10 raised to minus 11 this is of course written in decimal and in this representation there are several parts and I want to highlight them. The first is the sign this is a negative number. Then we have this 3.123 which is also called mantissa and then we have the base which is 10 here and finally we have the exponent which is minus 11 here. Now there is nothing sacrosanct about representing floating point numbers in decimal notation. We could also use binary notation where the mantissa would be a binary representation, the exponent would be a binary representation and the base would be 2. In this decimal representation if I look at the mantissa 3.123 it is basically saying 3 into 10 raised to 0 plus 1 into 10 raised to minus 1 plus 2 into 10 raised to minus 2 plus 3 into 10 raised to minus 3 and of course there is a minus sign because we have the minus sign here. Now I could write a similar number in binary where I could have a minus sign instead of the mantissa being represented in decimal I could represent it in binary and I could still have this radix point or floating point. The base would be 2 and the exponent instead of being a decimal number I could have a binary number over there. So if I look at this number represented in binary the mantissa here is we have of course the minus sign because it is a negative number. This one just to the left of this radix point this is the binary radix point this corresponds to in an integer the least significant bit. So here also we will multiply it by 2 raised to 0 just like the least significant bit of an integer was multiplied by 2 raised to 0. And then for the rest of it just like here we multiplied this by 10 raised to minus 1, the 2 by 10 raised to minus 2 and 3 by 10 raised to minus 3. Here we will multiply this one by 2 raised to minus 1, the next one by 2 raised to minus 2, then 0 into 2 raised to minus 3 and finally 1 times 2 raised to minus 4. And if you do all of this calculation you will find that this corresponds to minus 1.8125 in decimal. The exponent is once again a binary number and this is just the way we read off integers represented in binary. So it is 1 into 2 raised to 2 plus 1 into 2 raised to 1 plus 0 times 2 raised to 0 that is 6. So this number represented in binary actually represents minus 1.8125 times 2 raised to 6 if I were to talk about the decimal representation. And this basically gives us the core idea of how floating point numbers can be represented using bits inside a computer. We are going to have a bit for the sign, we are going to have the mantissa represented as a sequence of zeros and ones and of course we will have to agree on where to put the decimal point. The base or the radix will always be 2 since we are talking about binary representation and we will have the exponent which will be another binary number. Now when we write mantissa you know the same number can be represented in two different forms. For example in decimal 0 0.02345 times 10 raised to 12 is the same as 2.345 times 10 raised to 10. 
So which of these should I take as my mantissa? 0 0.02345 or 2.345? So here we say that a mantissa is normalized if there is a single non-zero digit to the left of the radix point. So to the left of the radix point there must be only a single non-zero digit. So therefore this is not normalized because to its left there is 0, this is normalized to its left there is a single non-zero digit. And the same notion of a normalized mantissa carries over even for binary representation. This is not a normalized mantissa because to the left of the radix point we have more than one non-zero digits whereas here to the left of the radix point we have just a single non-zero digit. And here is an interesting observation that if we are representing numbers in binary then in any case we only have zeros and ones to, to be used in our representation. And if we are saying that to the left of the radix point there must be a single non-zero digit that has to be one. So there is always a one on the left of the radix point in a binary representation of a floating point number where the mantissa is represented in a normalized way. And because it is always going to be 1, we need not store it. We know that it is always going to be 1. And therefore this basically gives us one bit of information for free. However, as you can imagine that there will be some difficulties in representing the number 0 because in the number 0 we will not find any bit which is 1 in the mantissa. But we will see how to deal with this in a couple of minutes. So floating point numbers are represented by allocating some fixed number of bits to store the mantissa in a normalized form and to store the exponent. Now of course since you are allocating a fixed number of bits for the mantissa and the exponent you cannot represent all real numbers and in fact there will be gaps between real numbers that you can represent and this is also called finite precision artifacts because we cannot represent all real numbers some funny things happen. So for example suppose I said that you have only 3 bits to represent the mantissa and look at this floating point number in binary 0 0.101 times 2 raised to 111 where this is a binary exponent. This mantissa is of course not normalized as you can see but suppose I said that this is my binary number and I want to add 1 to it and what would be the result. And you will see that if you have only 3 bits to represent the mantissa, you cannot really represent this exact result of adding 1 to this number. The number of bits you need in the mantissa would need to be far, far larger in order to represent this result exactly. And this is what we call finite precision artifacts that there are certain numbers that we cannot represent exactly and so we will represent them approximately. We will represent the closest number that we can using the number of bits available to represent the mantissa and exponent. Now in C++ how do we declare floating point variables? There are two data types called float and double. Float basically is 32 bits for representing a floating point number. 32 bits can also be thought of as 4 bytes of which 1 bit is reserved for storing the sign of the number, 8 bits are reserved for storing the exponent and 23 bits are reserved for storing the mantissa in the normalized form. And the approximate range of the magnitude of floating point numbers that you can represent goes from 10 raised to minus 44.85 to 10 raised to 34.83. It is an interesting exercise to actually look at the number of bits that you are using to represent the exponent and mantissa and come up with these ranges. I encourage all of you to try and do this. There is this other data type for floating point numbers called double in which you use 64 bits or 8 bytes. 1 bit to store the sign, 11 bits for the exponent and 52 bits for the mantissa. Here you have a much larger range of magnitude 10 raised to minus 323.3 .3 to approximately 10 raised to 308.3. .3. Once again it is interesting to calculate these ranges from the knowledge of the number of bits in exponent and mantissa. And as I said we cannot represent 0 exactly if we are trying to use normalized mantissa. So special bit patterns are reserved for 0 and not only for 0 for some other kinds of numbers like positive infinity, negative infinity and even for things which are also called not a number which are the result of certain operations. For example, if I try to try to divide 0 by 0 then I would get something which is not really a number and in 
a computer this is represented by a special bit pattern which is also called not a number and similarly there are other special bit patterns. How do you declare variables in C++ you put this data type keyword float then you give the name of the variable or you put the data type keyword double and then you give the name of the variable. How do you represent floating point constants in C++ programs we can represent them the usual way and in a C++ program it is not necessary for you to write the mantissa in the normalized form when the computer stores it internally it will store it in its normalized form or you could also use what is called the scientific notation in which you specify a number in this case 2357.2 and then you say e minus 2 the e could be small case or upper case and what it really represents is 2357.2 times 10 raised to minus 2 note that when we write this in a C++ program the base we are using is 10. So, e minus 2 really means 10 raised to minus 2. Constant floating points can also be declared in a C++ program using the const qualifier which we have already seen earlier. So, for example, if I say const float pi equals 3.1415, it means that pi has a floating point value which is not going to change during program execution and this is the value. Recall we used such constants when calculating the surface area of a tank in an earlier lecture or I could say const double E is 2.7183. So, in summary what we studied in this lecture are binary representation of floating point numbers and these are the components of the representation there is a sign bit there are certain number of bits for mantissa which is stored in a normalized form and there are certain number of bits for the exponent which could again be a positive or a negative integer and we have seen how to declare floating point variables in C++. Thank you. So, let us recap the advantages and disadvantages of floating point representation. What is the major advantage? Sorry, decimals meaning fractions. Okay. So, earlier integer representation we did not know how to represent fractions, we can now represent fractions that is one thing. But there is something much more important than that. What is it? So, when you say decimal fractions can be included, you are saying only part of the theory, part of the advantage. The real advantage is that you can represent the complete range of real numbers, not just integers. And large and very small. You could have a number 0.0000000005816, or you could have a number 12345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912345678912
So what should you say? Such an addition is not very meaningful. However, the computer number that it is, it will actually ignore any overflow digits. It will always store the remaining three least significant digits. So 991 plus 2 will become 001. You basically, you have a wraparound. Depending upon the compiler, there could be better features, like for example, the compiler may generate an instruction to warn you that your result is over. In general, however, the machine will just do its bidding. It has a finite number of bits for replacement, and that is the problem. Now, comparing the integer representation and the floating point representation of mantisa alone, forget the exponent for bit. You will agree that if I have a fixed number of bits in my memory location, whatever they may be, 8, 16, 32, or whatever, all of them can be used for an integer representation, two's complement or whatever, whereas only some of them can be used for the representation in a floating point. That means the precision of a floating point number, as far as its mantis is concerned, will always be less than the full integer. However, the value of floating point number can be much larger or much smaller because you have this additional export. Is that clear? All right. Now let us look at a quiz. I'm just showing a couple of slides prior to the last one of the quiz. Begin by talking about normalized mantisa. So a single non-zero digit to the left of radix position. Please note that if I were to do this trick for decimal number representation, I cannot ignore that digit just before the floating point. It will not be always one. It would be two, three, five, anything. So because I have a binary representation, I have the speciality that I can just ignore that. Basically, I am aware that I have great limitation of the number of bits with which I can represent mantisa. So I am to steal an additional bit. It is always advantage. All right. This is what the final uh, representation is. Now here is a question. Const float scale factor. This is just a declaration. Forget the word const for the time being. Okay. Forget the word const for the time being. It's a floating point represent. Right. Basically the question is. In my program, I have written minus 1.875 into 2 to the power minus 32. Minus 1.875 into 2 to the power minus 32. So what is the mantisa here? One point, minus 1.875. What is the exponent? Minus 32. These are decimal numbers. Imagine that you have a 32-bit representation. Out of those 32 bits, there is one sign bit, 8 exponent, 23 mantisa, and assume the number is represented as this. So first sign bit, then exponent, and then mantisa. So now write down the 32 bits, which according to you will represent the decimal value, minus 1.875 into 2 to the power minus 30. Write down this value on your paper and work that out. As I suggested, just don't do calculations only in your mind. Write down the steps through which you determine this value. Please remember the representation that you have to work out will have three components, sine, exponent, and mantisa. On one thing, all of us can agree very quickly, given that the value is minus 1.875 to the power minus 32, what will be the sine bit? One because the magnitude is negative. Please remember, this sign applies to the mantisa part, not to the exponent part. Although the arrangement that we have agreed upon is that there will be a sign bit representation in the most significant bit, the next eight bits will represent exponent and the subsequent 23 bits will represent mantis. So this is, this is the order in which those bits should come. We assume that this is how the internal electronic circuits of the computer have been designed. They will interpret these bits in exactly this fashion in order to do arithmetic operations on floating point number. All right. So this one will be one. You just have to work out 
what will be the exponent and what will be the mantissa. Please work that out. Even if you have forgotten what was stated exactly in that lecture, consider it from the following point of view. There are how many bits for the exponent? 8 bits. Is there a sign bit explicitly mentioned for the exponent? No. So that means 8 bits have to represent both positive and negative numbers. And we know that the best representation is a two's complement representation. So for the exponent is concerned, the question is settled. We will answer the question about mantissa later. But as far as the exponent is concerned, the bit representation should be two's complement. Oh, you have done it? Good. You have to convince your neighbor after some time that what you have done is correct. Convincing me is of no use. All have finished? Great. Exchange your notebooks and first quietly read what the other person has written. Please try to understand the importance of this. I had told you to write down detailed steps that you follow. It is important for you when you become professionals to be able to write down things not just the final answers, but a brief explanatory note. And this exercise will permit you to share with your neighbor how your neighbor has written that explanation and how you had written it. And you can compare and both of you can learn from that. It has nothing to do with computers and programming, but it has everything to do with very good professional characteristics. And that is why I want you to do that. So silently read the explanation. Now, having read it, discuss with your neighbor each other's solution. And as I said, if the values are different, then answers are different, try to convince your neighbor that your answer is correct. All right. So how many disagreements this time? Please raise your hand. Disagreements, where you found your answer different from your neighbor's answer. Just raise your hands loud and clear. So the disagreement is that one of them has taken 1875 and converted it into the uh, entire binary number. However, the other person says that if you remember the lecture he had said that in a binary conversion the most significant bit will be 1. So 1 can be forgotten and therefore 1 need not be represented and you need to represent only 0.875, that is 875 as the mantis. So what he has got is the mantisa 875 and the exponent. So his representation is 1, this is the sign. His exponent is 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. 0, 0. And his mantissa is, it is 13 zeros followed by 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. Is that correct? All right. Do you agree? No. So, there is a disagreement with both of you. All right. So, any other, any other result? So, I have another, another result. So he also has one, he also has one, 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 three zeros and two zeros. So there is a universal agreement on the exponent part, right? No confusion. Now what he says, that his mantis size, one, 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 zero, 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 all the remaining ones, zero. Do you agree with this? No. So there is a disagreement. Okay. Anybody who has a different answer than this? So what is your answer? Decimal. A point. A bit, you, a bit can be either 0 or 1. In fact, the whole point in the floating point representation is you don't store the point. It is implied. And the point is implied after the first significant digit which is always 1. So whatever mantisa you write, it will always be interpreted as one point whatever you have written. Do you understand this? Your mantisa, let, us, let me write some arbitrary number. Suppose this is your mantisa, 
the whole point of normalized representation is you adjust the exponent till such point that you get a 1 just before this point. This is a binary point now, by the way, not a decimal point. And then you don't represent this at all. The electronic circuits will assume that whatever bits you have put in the mantissa, they are to be interpreted as 1 point something something. And that point is a binary point. You don't store the point anywhere. That is implied. You don't store the first one. That is also implied. You store only the remaining part. All right. Now, can you work that out now? Or you have already done that? So, everybody is clear now what happens internally? So, let me explain. If this is your mantisa, 1.001 in binary, then you just forget this one point and just put 0101 as the stored value. Now, that 0101 should actually represent the original mantisa that you have, except that the leading one need not be represented. Entire 9.99 you have to convert into binary. You write a binary number which says 3 bits here, then a binary point and some bits there. You first convert 9 and then you convert 0.99. 9 is what? 2 raised to some so, something into 2 raised to 3 plus something into 2 raised to 2 plus something into 2 raised to 1 plus something into 2 raised to 0 plus something into 2 raised to minus 1 plus something into 2 raised to minus 2 plus something into 2 raised to minus 3. Exactly how you write decimal number and interpret it, you have to interpret the binary number. So, you have to convert integer part and the fractional part of a decimal number into the equivalent binary number. It so happens that the quiz has 1 as the decimal number, whose binary number is also 1. So, therefore, you get 1 binary point something. Now, in the, in the normal thing, you might get, for example, you might get a binary number as, let us say, 0, 1, 0, 1, binary point, 0, 0, 1, 1. Let us say something like this. This is your binary point. Now, before internal representation, you have to normalize this. That means you have to shift the binary point till you have only one before the binary point. So, this number will be 1 binary point 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1 multiplied by 2 to the power what? This is the binary representation. So, when you say plus 2, it actually means 0, 1, 0, whatever. Now, this is your mantis. Of this mantis, uh, you completely ignore this part and store only 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. You get the point. So, you have a decimal fraction, something point something, convert the integer part into binary, convert the fractional part into binary. Now, shift the binary point, not the decimal point now to the left till you have only the leading one. And that one and the binary point you ignore. What remains is the mantisa that you need to repeat. All right? Here is another practice quiz. We will not spend much time on this. The fractional part is same, you all agree? It is only the integer part that is causing us a problem. The integer part is what? 9 is equal to what in binary? So, 1011 followed by what? 1001 is 9 and 1001 point 111 and as many zeros as you want. Now, this is the binary representation. What we do? We shift the binary point here. So, this will be equal to 1 binary point 0, 0, 001 1, 1, 1, multiplied by 2 to the power how much? So the exponent will be 3. We will ignore this part completely because that is implied and the mantisa to be stored will simply be 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. And then as many zeros. Is that clear? Right. We are very fortunate that 
we will never have to deal with this representation in the entire remaining part of this course except perhaps for your quiz in the next week you are all going to be professional scientists or engineers so you should understand what happens inside but when we write our programs we don't need to worry about them we need to see only what appears on the outside thank you very much